Okay, let's get this program started. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the pre-Shavuot virtual talks. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rabbi Label Kahanov. And before we get started, I just wanted to go through a few technical details and the structure for tonight's, uh, tonight's event, and then we'll get right to it. So we'll be having, tonight we'll be having six speakers, each one speaking for 10 minutes, and I'm going to pre, be pre-introducing them now. So that way we don't have to have any, there won't be any pauses in between the speeches, in between the speakers. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the four Chabad centers that are participating in this event, Chabad of Agura, Chabad of Oak Park, Chabad of North Ranch, and Chabad of Westlake. I especially want to thank our six speakers for doing this. I'm very much looking forward, and of course, thank you all for tuning in. And while I don't anticipate any issues, technical issues, if for whatever reason there is an issue with the YouTube feed, then we have a backup Zoom link. And if you, you can find that in the YouTube description on this event, on this video. If you're watching this video embedded on the Chabad Kineo website, you need to click um, on the top. It will take you to YouTube to watch this video in YouTube. When you're watching it in YouTube, there's a description of the video. And on that description, there is a link to take you to the Zoom meeting. The Zoom meeting is not active now. It's only gonna be activated if we have any technical issues, any unforeseen technical issues with the YouTube stream. Okay, but uh, God willing, we won't experience any, any setbacks. Tomorrow night we celebrate Shavuot. And as you may know, Shavuot is the holiday that we celebrate the anniversary of the entire Jewish nation receiving the Torah at Mount Sinai at Har Sinai. But it's much more than that. It's much more than just celebrating an historic event. Every year on Shavuot, we are meant to receive the Torah anew. And practically speaking, this means that Shavuot is a time to reconnect and to reapply yourself to the Torah and the mitzvot and to experience personal growth in our personal journeys of Yiddishkeit. And that's the idea of tonight, to hear six speakers talk about something about either the holiday of Shavuot or Judaism in general that is personal for them and has helped them in their own journeys and their own experiences. And hopefully this will in turn inspire us to be able to continue to experience growth and to be able to grow in our own personal journeys and to indeed be able to receive the Torah this year on Shavuot in a profound and personal level. Um, with that being said tonight, you didn't tune in to hear from me, so let's get right to it. As I said, I'm going to be pre-introducing um, our speakers. So first we have Dr. John Yaakov Gutterson. And Yaakov first connected to Chabad while in college, currently works as the medical director of a psychiatric hospital. And additionally, he works with private patients in his office. And these days, of course, via Zoom. Um, Yaakov also created the Singing Psychiatrist. And this grew out of an awareness that today's world of psychiatry often doesn't address the human soul and spirit. And you, I highly suggest you check this out on YouTube, Facebook, or at his website, thesingingpsychiatrist.com. And I just want to mention that Yaakov is joining us all the way from the East Coast in Pittsburgh, and he's going to be speaking on the topic of counting to Shavuot. Thank you very much, Yaakov, for joining us. The second speaker will be David Bartels. David is the COO, the Chief Operating Officer of Low Set Fee, and the broker and owner of Help You Sell, um, which is a full service real estate. And as one of the top 1% real estate agents nationwide, he's established himself as a distinguished expert in the areas of real estate negotiations, distressed property solutions, foreclosure avoidance, and real estate investing. And he's going to be speaking on the topic of why I converted not once, but twice. Thank you very much, David, looking forward. Our third speaker, will be Dr. Langberg, Dr. Michael Langberg. Dr. Langberg was the chief medical officer at Cedar sinai He's now retired, but Chabad of Oak Park is very lucky to have him counted as their own, um, to have him in their community where he often shares profound Torah insights to the members of the shul. And he also, side note, he did a great job as the MC at an evening of unity and inspiration event for, uh, for the local Chabad centers this past July. And tonight he'll be speaking about the power of Shavuot in a talk entitled Shavuot, 
the holiday that is not as small as it seems. Number four, we have Barry Wolf. Barry is a first generation born American. Both his parents escaped from Russia and that history influenced who he became. Soon after graduating, he realized his future was dependent on his decisions and became a successful entrepreneur in the insurance business. He sold the last of his businesses to a New York Stock Exchange uh, company in 2004 and retired in 2008. And because of his upbringing, he has continually involved himself in community service and activities, including here in, the Jew in our local Jewish community, as well as in Israel. And he'll be speaking on the topic of the bridge between Jewish values and daily life. Thank you, Barry. And we have um, our next speaker is Hanan Block. Hanan is a licensed clinical social worker and an MJCS. He's a speaker, a psychotherapist, and a success coach. He spent the last 36 years helping people overcome adversity and to listen more deeply to each other when it's most difficult. And I also understand that Hanan is a talented musician. His talk is entitled, Why It's So Difficult to Listen to People Who Don't Agree With Us. Looking very much looking forward. And last but certainly not least, we have Lawrence Michelson. Lawrence is the president of Michelson Attorney Services. He's a speaker and the former host of a radio show. This was a nationally, nationally syndicated radio show. I'm just kidding, but he did have a radio show. And he's the author of Getting the White Picket Fence. And this book was a New York Times bestseller. And I'm kidding about that as well. But he did author this book. I believe you can find it on Amazon, Getting the White Picket Fence. And Lawrence is also a dear friend of mine. Um, we look forward to his talk, which is entitled Coming Home, My Personal Journey of Finding My Roots. Um, those are our speakers. I hope you enjoy. And without further ado, we'd like to ask Dr. Yaakov Gooderson to please take it away. Ready? <clears throat> thank you, Label. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Rabbi Brisky. I'm honored uh, to be um, part of this auspicious group of speakers. So good evening, everybody. Again, my name is John Yaakov Gooderson. I was 21 years when I wrote this song. I'm 22 now, but I won't be for long. Hmm. So if you think about that song, it doesn't make sense. How can you be 21 years old when you write the song and then in the song, it says that you're 22? That's the question. That's the question before us tonight. So when I was 21 years, 21 years old, I was a senior in college at actually the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm a West Coaster originally. And uh, suddenly I started my year, I didn't really have anywhere to live. And somebody suggested to me, why don't you check out the Chabad house, which was right there in the middle of Greek row. So I went over there and I met the rabbi, Rabbi Samuels, who gave me a, a grueling interview. Um, he said, so tell me about your Jewish background. And I said, well, uh, I won the attendance award um, at Temple de Hirsch because my, my father would drive me there every Saturday, uh, even when it was snowing. At that point, Rabbi Samuels said, you're in. And so there I was living in the Chabad house at the University of Washington, $75 a month for a room and dinners, kosher of course. So came the first Saturday there, the first Saturday morning and lo and behold, I was woken up. Um, they came, they said, John, John, we need a minion. There's only nine, there's nine of us, we need a 10th. And I said, wait a second. I was told when I moved into this house, I didn't have to do any of these things. I'm not interested. The only rule was you told me I had to wear something on my head, that's it. I said, but John, we really need a minion, please. So I said, well, listen, can I read a novel there? They said, yeah, you just have to sit there in the room, in the shul, and that's all you need to do. So I read a novel and they all prayed. The next Saturday and every Saturday thereafter, I got up early before they would wake me up and I headed on out to the University of Washington campus. Now imagine this, a college student early on a Saturday morning walking on the campus. I was the only one there, nobody else. 
how many college students are walking around the campus on a Saturday morning? But I was not going to get trapped. No. And there I was. During that year, it so happened that the Rebbe had sent out 10 Bacharim out to Seattle. And I thought they were from, quite honestly, from outer space. I had no, felt no connection. They knew nothing about the great Pacific Northwest and humanism, as far as I was concerned. But there were two who touched me. One was Abba Perlmutter, who many of you may know. He's a rabbi there in Southern California. Um, and he engaged me in a discussion about sports. We talked endlessly for a whole week about baseball, about Carlton Fisk's home run in the sixth game of the World Series, about Joe Morgan's on base percentage. And at the end of the week, he said to me, you know, do you happen to know anything about hockey? And I said, no. And he said, what I really know is hockey. Go figure. The other was uh, Mendy Glukowski. Mendy Glukowski is now a rabbi in Rehovot in, in the Holy Land. Um, he, it was 1976, and he said, you know why Ronald Reagan is running for the Republican nomination? That's because he really wants to run for president in 1980, four years later, but he's just getting out there, getting his name known. And there's going to be a whole conservative wave. And I said, you're crazy. You're absolutely nuts. There's no way that's going to happen. Well, sure enough, he was right. But of course, tonight, we aren't here to talk about politics. We aren't here to talk about, about religion. Um, two years later, I actually was in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, at that point, I was uh, teaching high school history. My parents called me up and they said, John, your sister, Jan, she is in this place called Crown Heights. And we think she's in some kind of a cult. Please go down there and, and, and get her out of that place. So being a dutiful son, I, I took the train down to, down to New York and saw my wonderful sister, Jan, and she was doing fantastic. She was happy as could be. So I was there for a few days. I wandered around and found myself going into Hadar HaTorah, which was the Baal Tshuva Yeshiva there, because a friend of mine was there. And up to this point in my life, I had never put on tefillin or anything at all. Um, I was sitting there reading and, and Rabbi Goldberg came up to me and he engaged me in the following conversation. He said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm a history teacher. And then he said, tell me, George Washington, who was he? And I said, well, he was the first president of the United States. And he, Rabbi Goldberg said, well, how do you know? And I said, well, everybody knows. We have primary source material. We have secondary source material. Everybody knows this. At this point, he's not calling me John. He's calling me Yankel because he's already gotten my Hebrew name and moved it into a Yiddish name. And um, he says, how about the Torah at Mount Sinai? Did that really happen? And I said, with all due respect, Rabbi Goldberg, you know, I went to Reform Temple. It, the Torah has great humanistic values, but there's no way that really happened. At which point he opened up the Torah and showed me certain verses said that all the Jewish people were there. It's the only time in history that entire people is going to, was, was witnessing what was going on. He was giving me the historical proof. And then he turned to me and he said, Yankel, as a history teacher, you should remember the following. And then he said to me the following words, which I'm gonna turn into a song. A man went to a psychiatrist was in a fog, says he keeps thinking that he's a dog. The psychiatrist said to him, when did this first start to be? And he responded, ever since I was a puppy. So we may laugh, but what he was saying to me was the following. You're a Jew, you need to look at this. And this man, he thought he was a dog. He didn't know his identity. But what's interesting, when he was a puppy, he didn't even think to ask. He didn't know his identity either. It didn't even occur to him to ask the question. He didn't ask the question until he actually thought he was a dog. And so many of us go through our lives not even thinking to ask the question. 
not really knowing what our real identity is. So Rabbi Goldberg said to me, as a Jew, don't you think you should look into this a little bit more, that maybe Mount Sinai really happened? At that point, I said four words, you have a point. And of course, then I started on my journey. I must add that my parents never sent any of my other siblings after me. So we're about to head into Shavuos, and Shavuos is the time of identity, because that's when we were all there together. And that's when we were forged, when we became the Jewish people, when it was brought into us, the godly soul that connects us all, which is why you can meet a Jew anywhere in the world, and within moments you can feel a sense of connection, a sense of home, a sense of resonance. So let me get back to my original question. I was 21 years old when I wrote this song, and I'm 22 now. How can you be both? Time. We've been counting the Omer, and here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we've already completed the entire Omer. So I'm just saying to all of you, since it's around the quarter to eight there in California, please don't forget later tonight. We count because each moment is precious. If you're in a car and you have a bunch of dollar bills, It'd be ludicrous to stick your hand out the window and let a dollar bill fly away and continue to do that minute after minute. And yet that's what many people do with their time. They don't take advantage. They don't realize the preciousness of every single minute. And that's what counting the Omer as we head to Shavuos, what counting the Omer is all about, recognizing the preciousness of each moment, the preciousness of life. As they say, a winter's night and the summer's day, well, it's like a year. And so once we know our identity, then we need to go into motion and recognize the value of each moment. Take the advantage, take advantage of each preciousness, of the preciousness of life. The leaves that are green, well, they turn to brown and they wither with the wind and they crumble in your hand. I threw a pebble in a brook and watched the ripples run away. That's all there is. And the leaves that are green turn to brown. So a good Yom Tov, everybody. A happy Shavuos. May we continue from strength to strength to know who we are and take advantage of every single precious moment. Hello, everybody, I'm David. Now, I wanna start by having to question Rabbi Shlomo and Rabbi Label's judgment for having me do this, but I still appreciate that they did. And, and as a confession, when Rabbi Label said, six talks in 60 minutes. All I heard was 60 minutes. So I guess I got to figure out how to do this in 10 minutes to tell you why I converted not once, but twice. I was trying to name this something else. I, my recommendation for what we call this talk was three versus one Jew, but the rabbis overruled me. Um, either way, it's the same story. It's a story about my faith and my search for spiritual fulfillment. And my story starts at birth, like most stories do, but I was born to a Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother. Eight days later, I had my first bris, and I was named David Ben Michael, otherwise known as David Nathanson. Before I was two years old, my father had disappeared, and I was raised at first by my non-religious mother and grandparents, and later by my mother and her new husband, whom adopted me and changed my name to David Bartels when I was eight or nine years old. Now, I did not grow up knowing my birth father was Jewish, and I was not raised with any religion at all. We celebrated Christmas at our house, but it was not a religious experience. It was more like Thanksgiving with presents. And as a teenager, I was exposed to Christianity through the families of friends, but I didn't ever really experience any spiritual connection or a desire to participate. At 17 years old, I met my father finally, about a week before I graduated high school and learned shortly thereafter that he was Jewish. 
And then in my 20s, I struggled with spirituality. I couldn't really explain it. I can't explain it now, but I knew something was missing. And though I was seeking some kind of spiritual connection, it never, ever occurred to me to go to a synagogue. And Judaism just felt very Christian-like to me. Even my Jewish stepmother was part of the Jews for Jesus movement. And so it was just foggy. So I ended up doing what I knew in my search. I went to church. I tried everything I was invited to. I, Assembly of God, non-denominational, Catholic, and, and others. And I was even married in an Episcopal church. And I eventually came to believe in a guide I did not know or understand, though there was no real connection. And I eventually obviously drifted away. During my divorce in 2007, I showed up at church again and seeking to heal my broken heart, but nothing. I went back again and again, trying to go deeper, but nothing. I was entertained, but not enlightened. I was not nourishing my soul. The message was good, but superficial. I did not want a superficial relationship with Hashem. I wanted something deeper and more meaningful. I wanted to be challenged. And all I was getting was a weekly pep talk. In each of these phases, I was encouraged, invited, and even pressured to participate in a public submersion baptism. I considered it seriously, but I never agreed. My participation would have been a mockery of what seems like a wonderful experience to those with an authentic desire to make such a public declaration of faith. But for me, it was just good theater. And it really made me wonder why they were able to find what I wanted so badly, but couldn't find. My introduction to Judaism started on a walk with a nice Jewish girl in the summer of 2013. Her name is Raquel. I was smitten and she was gently explaining to me how important Judaism was to her. If this were her story, she'd tell you that she was ending the relationship before it started, but I didn't hear no N-O. I heard she did not know K-N-O-W enough about me to make a well-informed decision. So I decided I should give her some new information so she could make a new and better decision. Now, you have to understand that I'm already thinking I'm half Jewish. You know, my, my birth father's family is Jewish, and I wondered, how hard could it be to become Jewish? But beyond that, I really knew nothing about Judaism or the difference between Christianity and Judaism. From church, I knew that Jesus was a Jew and rationalized that if Jesus was a Jew, Judaism must be similar to Christianity, like Episcopalian is similar to Lutheran. I just really knew nothing. Raquel didn't know it yet, but I knew that we already had a deep spiritual connection. I knew Hashem had been preparing me my whole life for this moment. I knew my life was about to change. I knew because I was experiencing a connection with Hashem that I had never experienced before. I could not and cannot explain it, but there was a certainty about it. It was calming. It was confident. It was exciting. In retrospect, it was just Hashem answering my unanswered prayers. Of course, I digressed a little bit. So let's go back to the walk in the park where I asked Raquel, what's the difference between Christianity and Judaism? Now, I didn't see her roll her eyes, but I'm certain that she did. And she began to share with me some of the differences and seemed to immediately realize, and I seemed to immediately realize that Judaism might be what I was searching my whole life for. And what she thought would convince me to just move along quietly actually ended up igniting my passion for all things Jewish. That night, my friend Google <laughs> began teaching me about Judaism and introducing me to places I could learn more about Judaism. Now, I wanna be clear. I was not doing this because Raquel insisted, not because I wanted to impress her, and not because I had any ulterior motive. It was because I had to, because my soul was demanding it. And so I found an introduction to Judaism class at a Dot Elohim, that's the Reform Temple in Thousand Oaks, and that seemed like the perfect place for a guy like me to start. Now, as I recall, it was a 28-week commitment with lots of homework. I knew I was on the right path because the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn, and my enthusiasm for study really grew. My buddy Google eventually invited me to a course on Kabbalah at Chabad of the Conejo in October of 2003, and that's where I was first introduced to Rabbi Levine, who was then leading that course. 
That served as my official introduction to Chabad and was the first of over 50 lectures, films, and courses I've taken, which translates into over 100 classes on Judaism with Chabad alone. The next thing I know, I'm meeting with um, Rabbi Diamond over at Adat Elohim for study and discussion as part of the reform conversion process. Now, by now, I was already living my life as a Jew. I was far from observant, but we celebrated Shabbat weekly. I'd stopped eating pork and shellfish. It was just small incremental steps for me. Now, as Rabbi Label was saying, I'm in the real estate business, and the idea of not working on Shabbat made me very uneasy. But in 2014, I stopped working on Shabbat. Now, I still drove, I still used my phone, but I didn't work in the classic definition of work. In June of 2015, I met with the Reformed Beit Dean, was submerged in the mikvah, had my second bris. That was much more humiliating than the first one. And I was given the Hebrew name David Ben Michael, the same name given to me at birth. Finally, I was no longer half a Jew. Now, after converting, my pride swelled again when I learned that my paternal grandparents helped find, found the Reform Temple in West Palm Beach, Florida, and my paternal great uncle helped found the conservative temple there too. These represented, I'm told, the second and third synagogues in that community. So my, I was able to understand that my paternal family was obviously very involved in the fledgling Jewish community that they lived in. And I was excited to learn this and became more convinced that I just had a Jewish soul. And I also think that that was the reason I could not connect to Christianity and why I declined repeated efforts to be baptized. Now, remember, I'd been going to Chabad classes for a couple of years at this point, I, but I'd never been to a service. I preferred sitting quietly in the back of the room, minding my own business without interacting with anyone. Today, I know how warm and welcoming all the rabbis are and the Rabbitsons and the community, but back then, those guys were pretty intimidating to me. They might as well have been bikers with tattoos all up and down their arms. But in 2016, I had the opportunity to meet Rabbi Shlomo at Project Torah. And as we like to say, it was love at first sight. We started, Raquel and I, as, as in we, we started to go into services and we became active in the community. And Raquel and I were planning to finally get married. We wanted Rabbi Shlomo to marry us but I knew my reform conversion complicated things. I didn't wanna ask um, Shlomo to marry us, so I didn't, but I did ask him what would be needed for him to be able to marry us. And the answer was not one I really was excited to hear because that required an orthodox conversion and a third bris. It also requir required more study than I had time to do. I would have to become kosher, I have to become Shomer Shabbat, um, that meant no phone, no car, no cooking. And on top of all that, we were going to have to sell two houses and buy one within walking distance to a shul. I really had no hope that we were going to be able to do it by our wedding date, but Raquel and I agreed to meet with Rabbi Block, whom Rabbi Shlomo had referred us to. But during that meeting, I realized that it wasn't just me that was going to have to do all this work. Raquel was going to have to do it too. But afterwards, I met with Rabbi Shlomo, who encouraged me and agreed to help me study. And we set a schedule to meet every Friday morning to kind of review things and keep me moving along. It was impossible, but we decided to take a deep breath and went for it anyway. That year, I even moved into the residence inn for a while and walked 17 and a half miles on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, somehow I still gained five pounds, but that experience really elevated um, my experience with Judaism and convinced us that being Shomer Shabbat was going to be the only way we were going to be able to achieve the deep spiritual connection to Hashem that I was seeking. For many months, I spent over 30 hours per week in discussions with rabbis and private study and shul and Hebrew class, lectures and other kinds of classes. But this was really remarkable to me because I had no time to do that. I'm, I run a very busy business that had 12 employees at the time. And then things got even more complicated when my 25 year old son died of a drug overdose a month before our wedding. I was devastated. It's devastating to think of now still, but the outpouring of love and support I received 
from this community kept me going and encouraged me to not only finish the conversion, but to keep the wedding date and make it even bigger and more joyous. It's not something that I did for someone else or for any other reason than a sincere, insatiable desire to know more, to do more, and to experience a deeper, more meaningful Jewish life. It was the hardest work I've ever done and by far the most rewarding. And it came at a time when I really needed it. In the end, it just feels like it was all a part of Hashem's plan for me. My son Dylan of blessed memory passed away on 11-23 of 2018. I completed my Orthodox conversion, complete with a third bris on 12-18. And Raquel and I, thank God, were married on 12-22. Judaism gave me the strength to just keep moving forward even when I didn't want to. It was the found, it's the foundation today of my marriage and the principles of Torah guide every decision I make in my business. And I think ultimately the best thing that I've learned from watching and listening to our incredible team of rabbis might be the simplest thing too. The one thing that we can all do is to just be a mensch, a light unto the world as Rabbi Shlomo likes to say, to demonstrate through our thoughts, words, and deeds, the beauty of Judaism. For me, I'm still at the beginning of my journey, but with Hashem's help and guidance, I hope this two-time convert that had three bristles is able to take all that I've learned and am learning to be a positive representation of Judaism and the Jewish way of life. I don't do it perfectly, but I have finally found a deep, meaningful relationship with Hashem. It was always there. I just found it when Hashem felt I was ready. So before I say goodbye, I just want to offer a special thanks to Rabbi Sapo, Rabbi Levine, Rabbi Brisky, Rabbi Mindy, Rabbi Ari, and of course, Rabbi Shlomo and the entire community of Chabad, especially um, my family at Chabad of North Ranch for welcome, welcoming me, I can say that, welcoming me, encouraging me, challenging me, and making me feel like I've been a Jew my whole life. They continue to challenge and inspire us to do better, to do more service, and leave everyone and everything better than we found it. I'll be forever grateful. Thanks. Can you hear me? Okay. I want to take a moment to thank all the Rebbeim and Rabbi uh, Label in particular, as well as all the speakers uh, assembled this evening to have this opportunity to uh, spend time with the community a uh, uh, day before Shavuos. Uh, Rabbi Levine had asked me to uh, take 10 minutes and share uh, with the, the community some personal stories of what um, Shavuos has meant to me. Uh, and I can um, faithfully report that for more than half of my life, Shavuos has meant absolutely nothing to me. I didn't know anything about Shavuos. I grew up in a very, very secular home. Um, most of the uh, religious connections with holidays and so forth uh, were not taking place. Uh, and um, on top of that, Shavuos is sort of interesting in its absence of things. Unlike other holidays, Shavuos doesn't really have any symbols, foods, or traditions that mark it as substantially different from other things. So, for example, there's no chauffeur, we're not fasting, there's uh, no sukkah, there's no four species, um, we don't have a menorah, we don't have latkes, we don't have vodka latka, we don't have a, a megillah, a grogger, matzah. Seder, we have none of that. There's no symbol or food that is clearly attached to the holiday. And so for many Jews, myself included, uh, Shavuos was an invisible experience. I wasn't even sure what, what was supposed to do with it, why it existed, and so forth. So for easily most of my life, Shavuos meant nothing to me. So uh, I did find myself over time being more uh, mysteriously attracted to all things Jewish. I did a lot of reading. 
Uh, most of that would have been philosophical, historical, or literary, very little in terms of theology or religion. Uh, and uh, I found myself involved in Jewish affairs. So for example, I was uh, helped uh, organize the creation of a Department of Judaic Studies at the, the university I was in. Again, these were based on kind of philosophical, historical um, backgrounds, not uh, religious in nature. But I, I kept reading. And I remember uh, one specific evening when I was in medical school, uh, I think it was like 1977. And I was the, the current book I was reading at the time was the Hertz edition of the Chumash. I think they called it the Pentateuch. And I got to the section that described the event at Mount Sinai, where upwards of 3 million people all, all together had the same experience in the same place at the same time. And I remember putting the book down thinking, huh, is it possible that this is not true? Because after all, for all the people who had allegedly gone through the experience, they would have shared that with their children and their children's children and so forth, so that it would be really difficult for someone to make this up and claim that all the Jews had this experience and were forever telling their descendants about it if it didn't happen. I mean, if, when you think about um, Jews are not really easy in persuading about anything, how could you possibly persuade three million people into believing something happened or supporting the concept that something happened when it didn't? So I found myself in a logic, logical conundrum. If I was unable to prove something false, does that necessarily mean that it must be true? And I'm sure there are really good um, uh, philosophical discussions about that. Uh, but in, from my, where I was sitting, uh, I found myself uh, intellectually uh, trapped, so to speak, in the reality that something of a of a, a spiritual nature between the Jewish people and God occurred at Mount Sinai at that time. And that literally shifted the world I was standing in. Sometime later, of course, um, I discovered that the holiday of Shavuot, the holiday that had no particular clear identity, was actually connected to the giving of the Torah, the epiphany that 3 million people had uh, with God at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai. And then things began to make sense. We're told that the uh, relationship, uh, the, the, the holiday affords us a relationship with God that a, uh, a husband and a wife have, a, um, a level of intimacy and connection that um, is not otherwise available in, to describe in any other way. And that explains why there is nothing symbolically or food-wise that we use to celebrate the holiday. Because in the end, a husband and a wife need nothing but each other in order to experience the intimacy the relationship creates. And the same is true with the Jewish people. Sort of all we need, so to speak, is our relationship with God as manifest uh, in, in the Torah. That's all we need. I'm not suggesting we can't use or need other things in the course of the Jewish uh, religious holiday cycle. But when it comes to Shavuos, the nothing is everything. The absence of things is a reflection of the depth of the relationship and intimacy between the Jewish people and God. A relationship that uh, you know, later in the Torah, we're told that no other people will have a connection with God as the Jewish people have had. And that also has been true. So I look forward today to tomorrow night in the next two days as an opportunity for me and all Jews to 
not just commemorate, but to re-experience, reconnect with the intimacy, connection with God. So I wish all of us a, a joyous holiday, one that we come out on the other end of knowing that we are connected to God in the most intimate of ways. Uh, good young folks. Good evening. My name is Barry Wolf. Thank you, Rabbi Lieber, for including me in this year's Shavuot Talks. My topic this evening, the bridge between Jewish values and our daily life. First, a very brief history of why Jewish values matter. Then I'll specify a few Jewish values in our daily lives. And lastly, I'll summarize with, do these values really matter in our world today? First, I believe our biggest problem today is our denying reality. Why is Judaism, our Jewish values, not only survived, but made significant contributions in every society, we have been a part in the development of human potential. I believe it was not happenstance. It was not an accident. We are blessed with our Torah, which provides us with Hashem's rules of the road for each of us to drive throughout our lives and to reach those lessons and to teach those lessons to others. Let me now discuss some of those Jewish values, how they impacted me in my past, how those values continue to bridge my life still today. As you will, you will hear how similar those values are in each of our lives. In order of no importance, first is the prohibition of bearing false witness, so don't lie. Instead, live a life of integrity, make and keep promises. When we make mistakes, because we all do, admit them and fix it. Be known as a person of integrity in every part of your life. As a father, there is nothing more important than teaching our children the Jewish values of character, how to swim in the world. They will enter as adults and then to make certain they develop the skills to earn a living. Additionally, we are not raising our children to be our children, but rather to be productive, responsible adults. We need to teach our children that no one can steal their character nor their brains. So learn our laws of Torah well and the ability to earn a good living. As a grandfather, we need to reinforce those same values, but reminding ourselves, we are not the parents. In business, as an employee, give your employer your best. As an employer, you are a leader. And as a leader, set the tone. The purpose of a leader is not to tame your employees, but rather to release the power of your employees to be the best that they can be. Much like the attitudes we need to instill in our children. As a community person, love your neighbor as yourself. Make a difference in your community. Do what you can do. As a son or daughter, Show honor to your parents. Remember where they came from and who you came from. Remember Shabbos is a day to stop from our daily grind to remember why we are here. And our Passover seders, be prepared to teach because we are each the rabbis, the rabbis in our homes on that evening. Tell stories, ask questions. Why were those great rabbis up all night discussing or arguing? My kids grew up in the 80s with me asking, how could Pol Pot have done what he did in the 1970s? And Rwanda again happened in the 1990s. How could they have happened after the Holocaust when we said, never again? Laning to fill in, 
helped me every morning set my head set my head straight for the beginning of my day, followed by my prayers of gratitude. Why was that important? Because some people have said to me, it's just hocus pocus. Think about it. If you're a natural righty, you put you know, the yod on your left arm because you're naturally a righty. And in order to good, do good in this world, we need both arms. Number two, we put the rosh on our head because in order to do good in this world, we need to use our minds. And the first wedding rings that we wear is when we wind it around our fingers and our hand, making a shin in our hand, reminding us of our value. So we're setting our heads straight for the day. Sadaka, it all begins with the pushka. And remember that others are watching especially your children and grandchildren when they're around. Kashrut, we eat two to three times a day, so we may think about what's right and what's wrong. Those values we hold highest are reinforced. Our belief in Hashem. I can understand one being agnostic because we have not seen Hashem with our own eyes. We need, to re- we need to remember that we are Israel, the people who struggle with Hashem. I am not perfect in following every Jewish value, every Jewish law, but I do my best to me be my best because I am a Jew. I am a father and grandfather. I am a husband to be. I am a son and I stand on the shoulders of those who came before me. And I believe I owe them my best because of what they have given me, what they have done for me. Does living Jewish values in our daily lives really make a difference today? We are the people of our memories, experienced and taught. I grew up sitting between my father and grandfather at Shul. And at our Passover seders did the same. I realized that honor as an adult. We were financially a poor family growing up, but I never heard complaints that it was someone else's fault. My parents were proud to live in America with the hope for their children to have a better life. Hopefully no more pogroms. I remember my father bringing a basket of apples to Shul for Simchas Torah. I believe that was our annual donation to the Shul. He did his best, no shame, only proud. I remember as a young boy, my mother telling me I was going to a Jewish overnight camp because someone who did not know us made a donation. That made a life lasting impression on me. We put our change, we put our change in the JNF Pushka next to the Shabbos candles before we light them. My father taught me by his example. He was always there to help his parents, his brother and family and us. My father was respected by those he worked with. I saw it with my own eyes. We are the people of our memories. In our world today, with so many sources of information, what do each of us choose to believe? What should we believe? For me, there's been no greater level of truth than my own experiences. I can't deny my eyes, my experiences, so I became stronger in character over my years and have been truly, truly been blessed. I am blessed. We are each blessed that we live in a community of Chabad rabbis and our Rebetzins who provide us with greater clarity about our past, our present, and most important with our futures, the future of our people and Israel. Our Jewish values, And our living those values in our daily lives is more important today, is more important now than ever before. 
Toda Raba, Chag Sameach. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hanan Bloch. I want to thank all the rabbis who have imagined and created this experience, and thank you to Rabbi Sapo for inviting me to participate. Those are the beautiful words of King David, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. From the narrow place, I call out to God, who answered me from the divine expanse. A psalm from King David. As we all know, we do have a serious problem going on in our society today. The lack of civility and decency and public dialogue, the seeming inability for people who disagree to listen to each other respectfully, which is resulting in increasing polarization. Polarization between left and right, between religious and non-religious, between even artistic and mathematical. And the consequence of this polarization can only lead to conflict. Each one of you has probably had the experience of, of being unable to listen in a particular situation to your spouse, uh, maybe your child, maybe um, your father or your mother, when you've been feeling so incensed. So what, what happens to us that when we are agitated or threatened, we're just unable often to listen to what another person is saying. We wait instead to make our point rather than to listen. So unfortunately, we are actually wired for conflict. If you take a look at uh, this diagram, which I will share with you, you will see here what we call the amygdala, a part of the brain which sits right there, the bottom. And you'll notice that this little picture has the description, the feeling brain cut off from the thinking brain. And this helps us to understand a problem that we all have. When we feel threatened, this little guy here, the amygdala, gets activated and causes us to default into three states. The um, fight, flight, or freeze state, which you may have heard about, meaning simply that we either flee, we fight, or we refuse to communicate. Maybe some of you remember feeling this way. This tendency um, is also accompanied by two other tendencies which we human beings need to know if we're going to be able to overcome polarization. These two tendencies are the tendency to split reality into two when we feel threatened, black and white thinking is what we call it, and also something called confirmation bias, which is the tendency that once we believe something to be true, we have a tendency only to seek out resources that will confirm that position which is one of the reasons that most people will either watch, watch only Fox or only CNN, et cetera. And so as this happens and we confirm our biases, we become narrower and narrower and narrower. And this makes it more difficult for us to include people who are outside of our immediate uh, circle, people who might have different opinions. Why do we do this? Generally, it's thought in psychology because it's difficult for us to be vulnerable. We don't like to be vulnerable. So what do we Jews have to do with this? And what does Shavuot have to do with this? Do we as Jews who are enlightened to the nation have any obligation to address this issue? I say that we do. In fact, I'll go far as to say that it's one of the most important things, in addition to protecting ourselves, that we Jews need to be doing now. We need to model healthy, respectful communication 
especially with people who fall outside of our circle. And we have many of our heroes to guide us, to be examples to us. One that comes to mind is Abraham. We know that Abraham is reputed to have brought strangers into his tent. He even left his conversation with, with Hashem to bring strangers into his tent. That's how important it was to reach across. So how do we do this? How do we calm ourselves and keep ourselves from splitting and from, from being taken over by confirmation bias? A couple of things very quickly. First, we have to be able to calm ourselves. So when you hear something that's confrontational, you have to be able to calm yourself and say to yourself, I'm safe. These are just ideas. These are just words. I'm not going to be killed right now. I'm actually safe. Um, secondly, we have to remind ourselves of what I like to call the golden triangle. And if you remember this, this will help you in your life. Golden Triangle says, it's three points, that things generally seem bigger, more permanent, and more personal than they actually are. And if you will remember that, whenever you feel threatened or facing a loss, you can remember this. Things seem bigger, more permanent, and more personal than they actually are. So once we've calmed ourselves and enabled ourselves to feel safe, we have a better chance of reaching across to others and instead of refuting them immediately, we can say the magic words, tell me more. It doesn't mean I agree with you. It means tell me more. I'd like to understand you. I'd like to know how you got to where you got. I like to think of this process as what I like. I like to call it join and expand. If you want to influence a person to understand Yiddishkeit better, or to if you're arguing with an atheist or whatever it is, or an anti-Semite, you're going to get further if you first join them and say, you know, tell me how. Tell me about how you think. And then maybe you'd be able to expand and move from Merchav Ka, the narrow place, to, excuse me, from the narrow place, which is uh, Hametzar, to Merchav Ka, which is the broader place. By the way, it's interesting that the word Metzar also has within it the, the same letters of Mitzrayim. We know from Pesach that Mitzrayim, in, during that time, we equate slavery with Mitzrayim, with narrowness. So the question is, to what extent are we actually slaves to our own, to the amygdala that I pointed out to you a little bit earlier? So at this time, Shavuot, I, I read that it is traditional for us to honor the, the yacht sites of um, both King David and the Baal Shem Tov. And that's very appropriate because not only did, the Baal Shem, did um, King David write that beautiful psalm. But we know that King David was not a perfect human being. We know that he sent a soldier to his death because he coveted the wife of that soldier. And yet he's a great king. This teaches us we don't have to split the world into black and white. We can think in a more integrated way, which I think is very important, meaning we can consider that some of our great leaders have flaws, and yet they're great nevertheless. The Torah itself, which, as we know, is given to us at this time, um, has 10 commandments, not just for some people, but for all people. It's an attempt to protect all people, all Jews for sure, from the things it speaks about, from murder, from theft, from losing our loved ones to someone who may be coveting them. So the Torah is, as what as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs said, is the great equalizer. He said that the Torah is a polemic against the abuse of power. I love that. The Torah is a polemic against the abuse of power. So is it not abusive to not allow a person to speak when they have something to say that we may disagree with? Should we not owe them the COVID of at least listening to what they have to say before we take them into the wider place where they may learn more about how we think? Um, King David we mark his yacht side. We also mark the Baal Shem Tov's yacht side. We all know, I think, many of you know that the Baal Shem Tov brought into the world the idea that one could be a, a um, one could have a close relationship with Hashem, even if one was not a great scholar. That through acts of chesed, through kindness, through um, joy as well, we could have a close relationship with God. And in that sense, you might say that the Baal Shem Tov too was also a great equalizer. He saw all people as having a potential, as having sacred sparks, holy sparks inside of them, which they could activate through joy and through service. 
We also know, of course, that Moses is described as the humblest servant of, of all. So what do we have to teach? We as Jews can teach that in dialogue, political dialogue, which is very difficult these days, dialogue between medical experts about the coronavirus, it's fine for people to be humble, to learn from each other. Uh, Pirkei Avot tells us who is wise, he who learns from every person. Who is wise, he who learns from every person. Can you imagine how different the dialogue would be in, our, in, the, in the world today if people actually embodied that principle? The Rebbe said something very beautiful, Lubavitcher Rebbe. Uh, he said that ultimate truth is, he said, how can we say we have the ultimate truth? How can any person say they have the ultimate truth? If they did, everybody would know it. Because how can ultimate truth shine in one place and not in another? Everybody would know. So what do we learn from this? That no person actually has the ultimate truth. That all we have at any point in time is just a part of the truth, a sliver of the truth that's available to us at a given point in time. And by teaching that to other people, we have a chance of bringing about greater humility, greater respect in the dialogue taking place outside in the world. As I begin to conclude, I want to suggest that it is not enough for us just to calm ourselves. It's not enough for us just to conduct ourselves in a respectful way with all kinds of people. This is good. But to be, really be a light unto the nations, it might be necessary for Jews when we hear disrespectful dialogue about political figures, about any, when we, when we hear public shaming taking place, Loshan Hora, it might be a time for us as Jews to say, no, this is wrong. This is not the way we behave. And we might, if we have the courage, more boldly consider actually taking that message out into the world and teaching more actively what it means to embrace people we don't know, to, to show respect, even when there are differences of opinion. I make the distinction for you between content and process. People may differ in their content, but the process can still be respectful. So perhaps you will remember this conversation from the beautiful Minna Meitza Kaharatika Yanani Demerchavka. I wish you all a beautiful Shavuot, that you will have the time and space to breathe in the beauty and goodness of this still generous world one day at a time. Chag Sameach. Hello. How is everyone out there? You know, I'm last. I hope there are some peeps still, uh, still watching this. Uh, wow. Am I, uh, am, I, am I good? Am I good? Is my uh, lighting okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Shavuos. What a concept. You know, I think of Shavuos, I think of cheesecake. I think of a lot of cheesecake, actually. I like cheesecake. I know everyone out there likes cheesecake. But honestly, when I was a kid, okay, growing up, I remember that anything my mom wanted me to do, I would say, I'll do it next Shavuos. At that time, I didn't know what Shavuos was or when it was coming. I had no idea. All right. So, honestly, I, uh, I'm doing a talk I usually do 50 minutes of here. And I've got 10. So, we're going to speed through my whole life. And I'll try to uh, touch on certain points. And just uh, stay with me. Okay, good. Good. All right. So, basically, I'm going to... Rewind back to around 19, oh God, 78, 79, it was Pesach, and uh, I was at my cousin's house, very observant people, very, very observant. And I, of course, not. They were getting just done with Pesach, and they were taking all the foil off the counters. Of course, I have never noticed uh, foil used this way, as I don't think Reynolds and Reynolds... Uh, Thought that would be used at some point, but I uh, 
I was astonished at how much actual foil was being used. And I, and for people who are not aware of the whole foil thing, it is quite the uh, Pesach extravaganza, is all I can say. All right. Um, you know, it was funny. After my cousin cleans up everything and she says to me, you know, now we go back to our everyday normal lives. And I subtly, uh, I was very subtle in my uh, reply when I said I wouldn't actually call your every lady, every normal day's normal. So, you know, they were, they were kind of crazy people. I mean, I would put in the category of, uh, of nuts. And, uh, but what's interesting was that at the time I was really involved with, uh, I wouldn't say really involved, somewhat involved with, uh, with uh, Morty Einbinder out there and Josh Gordon. And I was young. I was a kid, 17, 18, 19 years old. What was interesting, and I remember this very clearly, is I would uh, go to the shul, and, and there was this warmth. There was this incredible welcoming warmth, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. Honestly, I didn't know what was being said. I had no idea what a sitter was. Uh, you know, but I listened. I listened, and, and there was a certain amount of comfort that I really felt when I was there. It was really nice. You know, when I was growing up, you know, we grew up basically conservative slash reformed. We did some of the holidays, you know, and I, I, I resented uh, going uh, to shul. I didn't like it. I, I felt it was boring. It was, I was never connected. I, I never liked it. I uh, couldn't wait to get out of there. Um, you know, I, if you can remember now, how many people out there right now can say that they go to reform and conservative shul? Did your rabbi ever invite you over for a little Shabbos dinner? I don't think so. I don't think so because I sure wasn't invited. I mean, hey, listen, I'm not the most likable guy, but you never know. So I wasn't crazy about that. And, uh, but yet I felt this warmth at the few times that I went and, and, I, and, I, and I enjoyed it. So let's fast forward. Again, I only got 10 minutes. Let's fast forward to 2008. And uh, this was a time when I was in the process of really losing everything in my life. Lost my business, lost uh, my house, lost my cars, uh, Lost everything, uh, all the money I acquired. It was not a good time for me. It wasn't going to be Lawrence. But at the time, I met uh, a rabbi, uh, Rabbi Heidingsfeld of Moore Park, and he had uh, taken my kids uh, in in this camp that he was doing, and for some uh, reason, I, uh, I connected with him. Uh, great guy, really a great guy. But you know what's interesting is that I wasn't really looking for anything religiously, although I really feel that I think religious religion kind of found me. We really connected, and I went to his Kabod house. He just started. I was only his only congregant. It was him and me. I'd come there every Shabbos weekly. It was a really beautiful thing. And again, again, the warmth. I felt that warmth. I felt that that great feeling inside of uh, just being there and, and, and davening. And oh, it was really nice. And it brought back memories of, of the time when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. And it was like, Wow, this is really kind of cool, you know? And what's funny is that I was actually thinking um, at that time when I was 17 about the thought of being observant, but I really thought they were all nuts, and I sure wasn't going to become one of them. You know, there was just no way that was going to happen. But now it was different. Now, for some reason, I was feeling that amazing feeling of, uh, of coming to an observant life. It's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. So at the end of 2008, I decided one day to get off my couch. And as many people know of me, I don't usually get off my couch very often, but I did. I got off my couch and I changed the trajectory, trajectory, I don't usually use big words. I felt it was appropriate here, trajectory of my life. I made a unilateral decision to start the journey of becoming an observant Jew and building a solid foundation for my children. And by the way, I, I did say unilateral, huh? Unfortunately, my lovely bride was not so keen on the, my unilateral quest. In fact, at, uh, at one point, I was at a hotel looking at the ceiling and thinking, what the hell am I doing? It was not so cheery in the uh, Michelson uh, household as you can imagine. My parents thought it was a fad. 
They thought that I, you know, my mother would say, sure, a little kosher, you can't just be a little kosher. You can't just, can you go to a conservative shul? You have to be so Jewish. Do you be somewhat Jewish? I said, my, how's, how's, how's that going to work? In fact, my rabbi said to me, you know, you need to bring her, my wife, back to Yiddishkeit. It's easy for him to say. He was living in my house. So after two years, it took two years for my little loveliness to join me on, or I should say, our quest. And after moving here in Agora Hills, life changed for, uh, for my Deb, uh, not only discover her Yiddishkeit, uh, but discovered shadles. Now for you out, people out there not are familiar with shadles, uh, it's a hair covering and they're not cheap. If I knew what it was gonna cost me, for the shadows, I would have reevaluated my quest. You know, those mannequins are quite creepy. I have to be honest, when I go to bed, I just turn them around. But to think it's almost been 13 years. And if anyone would have told me that my kids would be going to a yeshiva, not a Jewish day school, but a yeshiva, I would have been thought they were crazy. My oldest one, my Jacob, it may be starting a second year at my note in Israel. My youngest is going to a yeshiva in Los Angeles. Where's a black hat? Never would have dreamt that. Not in my life. No way. Amazing thing. You know, my cigar buddies, you know, always ask me if I would ever go back to a secular life. My answer is simple. The life I had before never out would outweigh the, the incredible life I have now. There's, 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 there's so much meaning. There's an amazing meaning when you take on an observant life. There's structure, there's this foundation that I truly believe is an amazing thing, uh, uh, God's gift to, to the Jewish people. It's, it's a beautiful thing. You know, now Shavuos comes uh, tomorrow night. It'll be 3,332 years ago. Uh, that God wrapped his, his arms around the Jewish people. They were given the most holiest gift. I'm sure they experienced the absolute warmth as I had many years ago. And which brings me back still today as I attend my shul in Agora in Oak Park in North Ranch in Westlake and the community that I love so much that I, that I enjoy being around. There's nothing like a community. There's nothing like the friends, the dear, dear friends that I'm able to share things with, enjoy, have simchas with. It's a great life. It's a great, true, great, 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 great life. And in the end, all I can say is you too can have the same warmth of God's arms wrapped around you. And maybe, just maybe, finally coming home. Thank you. Wow. Just wow. Again, thank you so much to our speakers for those incredible and inspiring talks, for those incredibly inspiring words. Thank you, Dr. Gooderson, David, Dr. Langberg, Barry, Hanan, and of course, Lawrence. This was, a, this was a real treat. And thank all of you for tuning in. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to post this online, post a link to this on YouTube soon. So look out for that. Um, and with that, we'll conclude the evening. I wish you all a wonderful evening and a Chag Sameach, a happy Shavuot. It was great to see all of you.